Hello, 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 leavers, believers, and all you special guests. Welcome to Leaving Hillsong. My name's Tanya, and this is part two of the court case. We're still on week one because there's an awful lot of editing to do, and so if you're wondering if you're the only person whose episode ended suddenly, no, you're not. That's just kind of, I just do as much as I can do in bulk and then just ship it out. So thank you so much for your patience as we get through it. It's a pretty intense trial. There's a lot of information. And what struck me most of all, I guess, in week two is just the amount of work that has gone into the preparation for this trial from the prosecution. But... You know, the police investigation that goes back as far as 2016, following the Royal Commission, which ended in 2014, and the report was 2015. So it's been quite the unique situation, as you can imagine. Quite delicate and, you know, so important that we let it just take its course. It's very clearly been intricately laid together on both sides, so... It's been fascinating to watch, as we talked about in previous episodes. It's just a small little courtroom. You know, there's 20 seats or something. It's a local court. It's usually for kind of driving offences or fines and and things like that. Not wearing your helmet on a bike or or the media have an audio-visual link, so a lot of reporters can watch the proceedings at home it is illegal to record them even for the media so it's being streamed to media personnel but uh, you know I don't know where any footage would actually be right now or how anyone can access that or when in the meantime it's been me and Jake and a couple of other journalists and a few that come and go and some excess lawyers on the one sort of side and a few Houston's on the other side and it's a a cosy little arrangement. Strange, strange days indeed. And that's my excuse for why I've only done this much of my homework. I hope it's still helpful to you. There's lots more to come out, the best. So please just be patient and we will get to all of it. It's uh, very intense, very intense times for everyone. Hope you're all hanging in there. It's really wonderful seeing and hearing about connections being made between people reaching out to each other. Are you okay? How are you doing? Where are you up to? That's the stuff of healing. It's awesome. So stay kind. Keep leaving Hillsong. And we'll talk as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Check out Leaving Hillsong Insta and Facebook for updates on court this week. Only Christmas special. Here's part two of the court case, week one. She has been remarkable in being a real dog with a bone and handling Brett from start to finish when she first heard. So that's why she was telling Brett to go straight. Sorry. It'll be in, in church. Right. Right. In the church. The church will deal with this properly. She, all that information was there. She was saying that on the witness stand. She's 90 years old, we find out on the stand. She's got her hair is like grey and red and it's all like coiffed up and she's got these diamante barrettes in the back. She's confident. She's very clear. She spoke to the notes that she kept of the attempt she made to contact Frank Houston and Brian Houston to mm-hmm. arrange meetings to, to what she thought would be a resolution of the issue that, you know, there was this yeah. allegation against Frank Houston of a, of a, what did she call it? Behaved inappropriately with the boy. Yeah. Yeah. But she was very persistent and she also encouraged Brett very much to stay in house to let the church deal with it. And she was very explicit as she testified at the Royal Commission that should he um, participate in a, you know, in the church process, she would be supportive. But that if he went to the secular court, she said, I would, you know, I won't stand by you, Brett. Yeah. And she's got this in writing and that was repeated again in court this week. Yeah, she honestly believed, believed that um, from a biblical point of view in her own mind that the church mm. would deal with it, which is why mm. yeah. he just... 
respect. I have faith in the church. I have faith that this can be dealt with appropriately. So she was sincere, I believe, and genuine. So she was repeating that statement. And I think it was just to honor both Brett and just the leadership because there is that mindset like you don't want to send people to hell. You want, we've got to have a good Christian witness. And there is that idea of trust that she brought up, like everything needs to be done privately because it's about people trusting the role of the pastor and disclosing this information. Because she was clearly upset that all the stuff is now in the Royal Commission and in the, the court hearing. She was quite emotional about how she doesn't feel like people could trust the pastor anymore because of this type of information, the way that she was handling Brett and the church. It, and it, it is messy, but you can see that she was trying to do the right thing. I can't help but feel the same way that, you know, she had no husband, her husband was dead. So you know mm-hmm. what a single woman's status is in the assemblies of God or was. In the way. You know, she stood up to two of the most powerful men in the organisation and in the most, I mean, you know, when you read these letters, she's incredibly diplomatic and yet firm about wanting mm-hmm. to progress with it and... And she, and she did say something very powerful. She they asked her uh, about who Andrew Evans was, and they asked her, "Well, why did you go to him?" And she said, "Well, I was small, and meaning like she was a nobody in the ADOG. And um, Andrew Evans, she said, was a mover and shaker. Everyone would listen to him. That's why she went to this guy, this pastor in the ADOG, because he knew that everyone would uh, listen to him and probably get this resolved faster than her." Why Andrew Evans, though? As she, as she said, quote, he was a mover and shaker. Like, what was his title or what Like, what was his role? Um, Andrew Evans was the previous AAG president. Okay. It makes sense. Okay. Go straight to the top. Brian's predecessor, because Brian was yeah. president of the national executive of the AOG. Yep. At the time. He was the prior national executive of the AOG. So Andrew, Andrew Evans was before Brian. Barbara Taylor testified on the afternoon of day two and on the morning of day three, she was supported by Pastor Ivan Herald and his wife were there in the crowd. It's been like one of those, you know, what the AOG celebrity thing this week, slightly Mm -hmm. amusing. And the morning of day three, she continued, the defence did pretty much the same thing with her as he yeah. did with Brett, you know, try to discredit her memory, her versions of events. Day two and day three, yes. And she just held firm. She said, if I wrote it there, it's what I meant. I'll stand by it. That's what I said. That's what I meant. Yeah. And I, I also want to stress as well, most of her correspondence was with Brett's mother, not Brett himself. That came much yeah. later. Yeah, it, it turns out she was um, communicating with Brett's mum. And Brett's mum was communicating with Brett and... Brett's mum was then reporting Brett's status as things unfolded. And there were repeated statements. Direct quote from Barbara Taylor, the fact that Brett was hurt further was because nothing was being done by the church. Yeah, so well... So the church wasn't doing anything, she said, that's what was actually adding more salt to his wounds. What I found interesting about Barbara Taylor is that she said on the stand, quote, I was a school teacher before that, which was why I took that course in university. She took a course in university and had to take notes. And do a lot of this almost counseling stuff. That's um, right, the counseling so course. To me, that was really important because she was really adamant about this is why I was taking notes. And Bolton was saying, well, why are you taking notes when I was a pastor at these counseling sessions? Well, I need to take notes because it helps protect me as much as it helps protect them. Yeah, there's, and, and you know, there's so little documentation in this community, in this movement. All we have a lot of the time are our stories. It's fascinating and people's accounts of what happened because. People were mm-hmm. not encouraged to keep records of, yeah. you know, unpleasant situations at all. Bolton asked her, the evangelist attended the tent meeting in your tent on your church property. She said, quote, that's how I am involved in this, close quote. And yeah, no, wrong place, place, wrong time. Yeah, see, I understand where Barbara Taylor, she stopped in the middle of everything that was going on and said at some point, quote, how do you handle this with the least pain involved? That was a pretty powerful moment. Oh. But she was kind of, oh. she said that she was overwhelmed by Frank and Brett Stanstock and Brett Stanstock's mother. She felt alone in this, but from a pastoral point of view, she didn't want to add more pain to all people involved, including Brian Houston and his family. So that's why she had difficulty. And 
And what was that sentence again? How do you handle this with the least pain involved? I mean, how difficult is that to have as an approach? It's, you would think, you would hope any human's instinctual yeah. approach. Hey, a lot of people have issues with the way she insisted on dealing with it in house. Mm -hmm. And I think that we really just need to come to grips with flawed heroes or flawed characters or the fact that people aren't all good or all bad. And, you know, that's going to be debate for a long time to come. Um, yeah. And that's um, okay. We weren't allowed that in a fundamentalist setting, but it's actually okay to be confused about people or have mm -hmm. a range of feelings towards people and have to arrive at a decision about what you want to do in relation to them. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Absolutely. They asked her about Mudford and she said, he's an evangelist and he's bombastic. And they said, what do you mean by an evangelist? And she said, oh, he was 40, 45, but being an evangelist means wearing hobnailed boots where angels fear to tread. So you can start to see her personality, charismatic. Angel fear to tread, that's right. Oh, I miss those days. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and, and, and when she, she, she clarified when she went with it, Mumford to see uh, Brett Sandstock that Sunday morning. Uh, she said, quote, I should never have gone, close quote. And she said, quote, I was carried away with the situation. I shouldn't have gone in hindsight. It was the wrong thing. The part. wrong thing. I mean, imagine if people just said, hey, I shouldn't have done that. It was the wrong thing. Yeah. Just, you know, again, a, 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 simple, a simple reflection that, like, if you're human, you're going to get stuff wrong. I, and even mm -hmm. if you're a pastor, um, mm -hmm. it just could have changed a lot of things if people could have worried about the pain level. And Barbara said from the stance that she knew nothing about the money. Quote, I felt sidelined about this. I knew nothing. And then they asked her, did anyone tell you about the money being paid? And she said, quote, I was kept in the dark. I did fail to mention that part the point of the mcdonald's meeting i've missed the whole section guys sorry but the point of the mcdonald's meeting with brett and Navi and frank was the finalization of a payment of ten thousand dollars brett was offered he wanted the phone calls to stop he wanted the harassment to stop and so you know he wanted frank to go away he signed the napkin that Navi put in front of him and you know, that was the end of that. Frank felt that he had achieved some kind of level of forgiveness and he could face God or something, just anyway. And so there was also further discussion, which, had, well, you know, it was brought up all in the Royal Commission about that money not arriving to Brett, Brett having a phone conversation with Brian Houston about it and, and Brian becoming angry and saying, you you know, you'll get your $10,000. Uh, there's a statement in that conversation, there was a lot of debate over who called who, and that was when the defence had been trying to kind of track Brett with his recollections and dates and who called who and who said what. And the essence of that call was Brett saying he hadn't received the money and it had been a couple of months. And Brett has said in testimony at the Royal Commission and on Tuesday of this week, day two, that... Brian said to him, this is all your fault, you know, you tempted my father. Mm -hmm. Brian Houston has always categorically denied that that statement was ever made. There's no evidence one way or the other, but it did again come out in headlines this week. So, you know, Barbara Taylor, in the meantime, is writing letters trying to arrange meetings and healing, and these boys are out driving around in a green jag trying to push money on a on a survivor to, to, you know, well, as he said, he was paid for his silence. So that's the sidelining, yeah, that Barbara's talking yeah. about. Yeah. Okay. I found it very fascinating after the 2.30 in that session there that Barbara Francis Taylor said, quote, of course his wife would have known that being Bobby Houston. There's, I mean, there's always been a lot of debate online and, and that kind of thing about specifically why 
Brian Houston has been charged for one offence at one time and not anybody else associated with this case, even with some of the evidence that came out of the Royal Commission in 2014. And I guess it's to be seen what the case is is going to be like as it progresses. And I think that kind of really does lead us into the next witness, which, I mean, it's so strange. Now we're back in the waiting room and there's uh, John McMartin, who is the, you know, has been in the Assemblies of God, Australian Christian Church, whatever, for 30 years. He's run one of the churches that Frank started in a place called Liverpool. It's changed his name to Inspire Church. Now, this man's on separate sex offences or a, a sex offence charge himself, and he's actually waiting for a verdict. There's an allegation that he indecently assaulted uh, an 18-year-old woman from his congregation. So you would imagine this man would be under a lot of pressure. I, I mean, I think there's a verdict by the end of the month for him. So he was, he was kind of walking around just fairly relaxed and confident in the interim while Barbara Taylor was on the stand. And it, it was interesting. And then waiting as well in the waiting room, but seated was the general manager and Brian's very old companion, George Agajanian, who he was, from my recollection, he was the only person really who was able to kind of cope with the witness box last time at the Royal, when I say last time, at the Royal Commission. The pastors struggled a lot with being directed and told what to do. But uh, George was then called to the stand next. And unlike Barbara Taylor, George has, George has basically pleaded the fifth, as the Americans would say it. So he doesn't want to give evidence which may incriminate him for a criminal offence. And so that what happens uh, is that the judge says, no, I require you to give evidence, but I'm going to give you a certificate, uh, Section 128, I think it's called, which is that you will then get immunity if your evidence incriminates you. And that's the kind of thing that Barbara Taylor refused and Mr Agajanian uh, took the opportunity to take up or whatever. So do you want um, to... I actually didn't find what he said really new. You can just read the statement okay. from the Royal Commission and get a good general idea. He kind of spilled the beans when he was looking at from the stand, the, the board minutes at Hillsong Church boardroom in, in November 2000. George Gregory Agajanian kind of set the scene in a lot of Brian Houston's repeat, repetition of this story over the years where George came to him towards the end of the afternoon with a list of things to talk about. And as Brian would say, by the way, there's something about your father. So that's the George that came in just to break the shocking news to Brian. So George Agajanian started talking in a statement about how he got a phone call from Mad Dog Mumford getting a story from uh, Brett's mother about Brett being sexually abused by um, Frank Houston. So that was in a phone call straight to George and uh, George took that information to Brian Houston on an afternoon and he was just started reading out a list of things to Brian and the last thing on that list was Frank, and he said, by the way, there's something about your father. So this and was their usual meeting. This was their business meeting that they would have, I think, weekly. They would meet to discuss the general manager with the CEO to, you know, discuss the week's events, yeah? Yeah. I think he said he left it to the end because he knew it was going to yep. be a biggie. They want to talk about how Nabi Saleh and George Abidjanian were brought on to help with her transition. In his testimony, George says that he told his boss, Brian, what had transpired on the phone. Brian said he would tell the ACC and the ACC would investigate. ACC, yes. Through a special elders meeting, the prosecution asked George why, why these allegations weren't reported to the New South Wales children and young people protection department and he said it was new and they were very unfamiliar with the legislation and that, that was a big deal at the royal commission the fact yeah, that they didn't report frank now their i believe their policy manual had been created in may 
of that year. George Abijanian received that phone call from Mumford in October, late October. That's right. Late October of? 1999. Late October of 1999. George didn't remember everything, but he said that Brian never said to him that the victim doesn't want police. Mm -hmm. He said he was definitely told it, but he can't remember when. It's possible he told me the victim wanted to go to the police and they said, you know, think more carefully. And he said it was a very long time ago. And that's when he said, look, I also had a city counterpart working with me, John Mays, who was in the same role as I was, but in the city office of Hillsong. And he mentioned something about Brian Houston's diary at one point, which got my ears. Okay. I thought the um, that's all I'll say. I just thought that was interesting. I had mentioning having that Brian Houston had a diary. I mean, I don't believe John Mays has been brought into the equation before. I think he mm. is, or has up until recently been the head of oh. the resources at. So here's, the quote, here's the quote that I wanted to read out. George Abujani said that he got that phone call, that news in the morning, and had a meeting with Brian that afternoon. Quote, and I took that matter to Brian. That was quote. I think he had been in their employee probably 10 years or something by that mm -hmm. stage. He'd been around a long time. Okay, so the prosecution said the accused at this time was then the only conduit between the national executive and Brett, which was agreed upon. So the Crown's case is that Brian told the executive the victim did not want police and that Brian filtered that information to the executive. So the prosecution said the accused at this time was the only conduit then, as far as George knew, between the executive and Brett, the national executive. You know, Kevin Mudford had then handed it over. So, you know, Brian had said he would take it to the ACC and to yep. the executive there. So he was the only Conduit. The Crown case, my notes say, Brian Charles Houston told the executive that the victim did not want to go to the police and that Brian filtered that to the executive. Uh, that established a story that has been told from day one, basically, uh, from everybody's memory. That, you know, it's mm -hmm. a story that Brian's repeated in the media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one day George came into his office and he called it a fakeful day, that fakeful day. Fake um, phone call, too. And I, I think that's, what have you got on George that you want to share? They did ask him at some point when he said, um, when Brian removed his credentials, and um, they asked Agajanian, what did Brian do to Frank when he got that information? And he said he removed his credentials. And then it was asked about Agajanian, what are credentials? And Agajanian said, credentials to allow Frank to minister and preach within the AOG ACC. And I just found that interesting because he didn't, Frank didn't need credentials before coming to Australia back in the day to preach okay. the AOG and ACC. So, I found it weird. That's all it was. What's weird about it? Tell me. It doesn't mean you can't pray to people. It doesn't mean you can't still. I think this is why Zerner had difficulty trying to understand in his letter and correspondence to the AOG as well, like what can Pastor Frank do up in this church, up, up on the coast? Because I think what is a credential? I think what he actually gave at um, this point in time as a, as a definition doesn't work. <laughs> Credentials to allow Frank to minister and preach within the AOG ACC. And minister, what does that mean? Can he still pray for people? That's what Zerner was saying in his correspondence. He was another pastor who had to look after Frank a bit later. I just found that a very interesting definition of what Agajani said was a credential. It, it's the, a very interesting point that you raised because it's always been used as a uh, a sign that, you know, actual actions were taken that would change things. That's a very interesting point. And Pentecostals and Charismatics, they have this idea of anyone can minister. We're all called by God to minister. Anything from praying to getting a word from God and getting a knowledge, a word of knowledge to someone and healing, that's all considered ministry, body ministry. So could Frank do that in that capacity? That's what the confusion was around that word much later when Frank was going to other churches. Interesting. Um, you know, 
Yeah. And it's, you know, it's discussions we've had before about who gets to call themselves a pastor or a leader or a this or a that and the the assumed authority behind that and we know mm. what the general person in the community might think that actually means. From Mumford to December 1999 meeting, you had conversations during that time with Brian, yes. So it was asked to um, George Abijanian from Mumford to, to December 1999 meeting, the executive, quote, you had conversations during that time with Brian, close quote, Yes. Okay. Are we ready for Johnny Mac? I think so. So um, on the 8th of December, John McMartin, the 30-year veteran of the AOG, Pastor Johnny Mac, took the oath. And he also took the option of a Section 128 where his evidence will not incriminate him he will get immunity or if it sorry if it does incriminate him he will get immunity unless the information that they give under this act is false so if they perjure themselves they're still up for perjury but apart from that you know if they give evidence that apparently they get immunity because that's how important the evidence is so so he said to him what was your Role, he said he was the senior pastor of Inspire Church. He left two years ago. Mm -hmm. Are you still a pastor now? The prosecution um, um, asked him. He said, no, you were the ACC, no, sorry, be the ACC state president. So, John McMartin, you were the ACC president from 2008 to 2018 because Brian uh, stepped aside from being the president. Yeah, he was the state president because he passed the whole problem is he passes it on to Brian who's national, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. John McMartin was asked, are you, uh, so John McMartin, you were the ACC national president from 2008 to 2018. When did you get information, he said, about Frank Houston's assault against a boy? And... When they asked John McMartin, when did you first get information uh, that Frank Houston was alleged to be a pedophile? John McMartin said. I'm pretty sure John McMartin said it was September. He said, I got it in my, like, we were so shocked. We were so, like, what? Because he got allegations from Barbara Taylor, but he never got a name. Yep. of the perpetrator and he never got the name of the victim and apparently he was asking her again and again i need this information so and then you need to also provide a statement and barbara taylor wouldn't do that until september of 1999 and when he found out it was frank Houston, he, he said that the pressure was now suddenly on him 